happening nowadays is we've got chemists and mathematicians and food scientists creating quote unquote food products that are chemically designed to elicit our inability to stop eating them. And what that's called is bliss point. It's an actual term in the food production industry. And what's crazy is children have a bliss point that's twice as sweet as an adult, which is why they can handle that, those crazy doses of sugar. And I think that's where bio-individuality comes in, right? Like for me, if I've got a sweet craving, actually one of my favorite go-tos is cucumbers with salsa. Um, the spicy of the salsa takes away the craving for sweet. For any of you uh, women listening who were active in your 20s, maybe got married and had kids in your 30s and are now in your 40s, maybe you can relate to the journey that I traveled. I uh, never had to worry about food or my weight, felt awesome, and I just thought that was you know, normal. I did not understand why people struggled so much. Then I got married and I had two children and life changed. Change is good, transformation is hot. And I truly believe for an outer transformation to happen, you have to do your inner, your inner work, your emotional work. Welcome to the Live Fit Podcast with Glenn Johnson, your resource for all things that contribute to good health. You will hear expert advice and interviews with leading authorities on fitness, food, fat loss, mindset, and the mind-body connection. You will find show notes, articles, and health programs at livefitpodcast.com. Ah, uh, yes, it is time once again for the Live Fit Podcast. I'm your host, Glenn Johnson. Thank you, everybody, for listening. I truly appreciate it. This is episode 93, part five of the Sugar Series. Today, my special guest is Jennifer Powder. She is a life coach, weight loss, and fitness expert, wife, mother of six, and an entrepreneur. She dedicates her life to helping women find inner peace and a healthy body. I asked her on the show today to share with us how she deals with sugar in her life and that of her clients. She will share with us how she helps her clients find happy, healthy, and fulfilling lifestyles. And believe me, they're not mutually exclusive. Before I welcome Jen on the show, I'd first like to ask if you enjoy this show, please rate, review, and subscribe. And speaking of reviewing, I want to read one. I want to read an iTunes review that I recently read. It's from Kotula. The title is A Smart Mix of Health Topics, and they gave me five stars. So thank you, Kotula. And they went on to say, This is a good source of health information. Pretty short and sweet. I appreciate the effort. So, once again, you don't have to write a great big old story. If you like the show and you want to tell others, you could just leave an iTunes review. Really easy way to do that is to go to the website and on the show notes, there's a link to leaving a review on iTunes or Stitcher. Um, also, there's a, a quick link I have. It's called livefitlean.com slash iTunes. Pretty easy to remember. Also, if you'd like to support the show in another way, you can go to patreon.com slash livefitpodcast. There's also a link on the website. And speaking of links, you can send me a voicemail if you have a question that you would like me to answer on the show, or if you just have a comment or you know, want to keep it between us, that's fine too. You can also email me at Glenn with two N's, Glenn at livefitpodcast.com. Now let's get on with the show and see what Jennifer Powder has to say. Hi, Jen. How are you doing today? Really great, Glenn. Thanks so much for having me on your podcast. Oh, it's my pleasure. You know, when I was looking on your website and your Facebook page, I, I realized that I just had to have you on my show because, well, birds of a feather for one, but I, I just really like your approach. You're, you're no nonsense. You're no glitz, no glamour, but still professional and um, clean. Direct, you're, direct, and there's not a lot of BS around here, that's for sure. Yeah, and your website is beautiful. It's really it's really clean, um, simple to navigate. You, you know exactly what you're looking at when you're looking at it. Um, so I, I, just, I just really feel that you are somebody that has something to share with my audience. And since I'm doing this sugar series right now, we're going to talk a lot about sugar because from, from what I've seen of you, you, you definitely address sugar a lot with your audience. So we're going to talk about that. But before we do, uh, tell us a little bit about you. Who are you and how did you get to be doing what you're doing now? And what uh, is exactly you're doing? So fill yeah. us in and all that stuff. 
<laughs> awesome. Okay, thank you. Um, well, my name is Jennifer Powder, and I am a weight loss and fitness expert. So that's sort of my professional space, but it's also a personal passion. And the reason why, it's actually an interesting story. And for any of you uh, women listening who um, were active in your 20s, maybe got married and had kids in your 30s and are now in your 40s, maybe you can relate to the journey that I traveled. And for me, in my 20s, uh, you know, both of my degrees were in um, – exercise physiology. My master's is in that degree. I'd run numerous marathons, was a competitive Canadian lightweight rower, uh, never had to worry about food or my weight, felt awesome. And I just thought that was, you know, normal. I did not understand why people struggled so much. Then I got married and I had two children and life changed. Um, to be really transparent, I was in a different business then, but an entrepreneur. Uh, we started to struggle financially. Um, and then really transparently, uh, my marriage started to have lots of cracks in it, and I didn't really understand or know that. I was you know, sleep deprived with kids, and I started to cope with um, two things, red wine and chocolate chips. And I would be, you know, <laughs> eating a handful of chocolate chips and saying things like, yeah, I just don't know why I can't lose the baby weight, right? And this is like a year later. And so I figured what I needed was to exercise more, right? I think we've heard that over and over, just exercise more, eat less. And back then I actually did believe that. So I signed up for Ironman Canada. Uh, you know, I've done that before and I figured I needed a big goal. And um, well, nothing could have been further from the truth. I crashed and burned really hard with my adrenals and just feeling so depleted and run down that I just, I kind of had to just come to a, get honest with myself and go, oh my God, like, is this the way I want to live? And my answer was a clear, no, I need to change. Now, luckily, you know, I was a certified coach, uh, had the background, um, you know, was active, but I dove back into weight loss and nutrition and exercise literature. And I began my own transformative process. And within eight months, I lost over 30 pounds, ended up finishing and doing or doing my race, Ironman, and uh, was passionate about sharing the truth of what goes on in the weight loss industry and teaching a better way. So that has been what I've been doing now actively for the last five years and helping you know, thousands of women understand food, their bodies, escape the dieting or the crash diet prisons that they put themselves in and actually feel really at peace with food again. And along the way, their families get healthier too. So I'm lucky I get to do something I really love. Wow, that is fantastic and good response from people. And have have you had a longevity uh, follow ups with some of your clients, some of your earlier clients? Yeah, that's one of the things I think I'm most proud about. I think if you and I, are, you know, if you and I are really honest, diets they work in the short term. They help people lose weight, but I'm they sure. do not teach people how to live life or keep the weight off. And so, hence the you know 20, 30, 40 pound weight regain after a diet is really common. And where my clients thrive is that once they're done working with me, they never worry about their weight again. It, it is just, uh, it's, it's just they've, they've adapted into a new normal with healthy habits. And a lot of it is they've done the emotional work along the way. So one of the things you'll see on my website is change is good, transformation is hot. And I truly believe for an outer transformation to happen, you have to do your inner, your inner work, your emotional work. I completely agree. I've had a couple of uh, guests on the show here talking about emotional eating, the psychology of eating, uh, the the mental toughness and mindset and things like that. And that's what I've been you know, talking with my clients about and, and students for years is just that you have to get your head in the right place or else whatever you do to the body is is temporary. You really have to lead with your head. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And you know what I find is that a lot of people, you know, a lot of, I mean, a lot of people don't really know how to feel their feelings. We're so often we're taught to suck it up or that's just the way life is or just grin and bear it. And, um, you know, you're coping with stuff that you tolerate things you're unhappy with. And often we just don't have a skill set. And so when we're sad or lonely or bored or tired, uh, we don't crave kale or carrot sticks. We go to the sugar. <laughs> we go to the things that will literally give us a feel good feeling. And we want to feel good. So I understand why we engage in that behavior. I mean, certainly I did. And uh, we got to, you know, just saying don't eat chocolate or don't eat any sugar without doing that underlying work never really gets anybody anywhere. No, no, it sure doesn't. But um, I have a bit of an argument with you because I, 
I do crave kale or broccoli or or uh, things like that or spinach now and then too. So, oh, uh, I but... crave it when I'm healthy, but not when I'm in the throes of crisis. Okay, it, okay, good point. Yeah, good point. So yeah, like, it, I cannot wait to eat my like I totally like I literally crave kale salad. I've got an awesome recipe, but when I am like truly hit with a life storm. Um, it, it that for me is when I'm in the throes of like kind of emotional crisis. It isn't my natural go-to. <laughs> wine and chocolate, wine and chocolate. Yeah, or something, right? Yeah. Whatever, wh whatever works for you. I was just thinking of last night. I came home from work and I was just totally exhausted, and beat, and feeling uh, just a, like a little bit off. You know, like I'm probably fighting a bug or something like that. And I looked in the fridge and. You know, we had all kinds of things, a whole variety. I could have had sugars. I could have had starchy carbs or, you know, whole wheats or meats or, you know, anything under the, you know, in a grocery store. We pretty much had a, a selection in my house. And instead, I had a salad with a little bit of smoked salmon. And it was perfect. Yeah. Well, and I think that's what we want our clients to get to, right? Or the people listening is that eventually you develop a skill set so that when, you know, now when I am in those emotional or, you know, my mom was a, you know, she had a big fall this summer while visiting me and had emergency surgery and, you know, it was very stressful. And yet chocolate and wine were not my go-tos anymore. I've got a new and better skill set um, and know what to do. And, you know, that's, I, I think for me, that's been um, just a huge reason why I've been able to, you know, have lost that weight so long ago, have kept it off easily, effortlessly, and uh, what allows, you know, other people to do the same. It's a difficult place to get to. And I've had uh, several clients who I've explained what intuitive eating is, and they just look at me like, a, <laughs> you know, like a three-headed Martian or something like that. But, th but at the same time, they're looking at me longingly going, wow, I want to do that. How, how, what does that feel like? What's that like? And I'll describe it. And it's so different from their perspective, what they know. Mm -hmm. and, and so then they ask me how I can get them from where they are to let's say where I am, where, cause I'm a, I'm definitely an intuitive eater and not to say I don't have cravings or, or eat unhealthy foods or eat too much of healthy foods and all those things. I'm, you know, of course I am, I'm human and, you know, I experience stress and joy and, and all yeah. these other emotions and in, even just enjoy the flavor. And, you know, you get a, you get a glass of wine under you and then you're like, ah, oh, screw it. I'll have another uh, helping, right? That sort of thing. And, and, you know, I'm human as, as everybody is, and I don't expect anybody to be robotic or perfect, but how do you get to a point of being an intuitive eater? I have my approach, but, but what's yours? Well, you know, for me, I, I often, um, I go through a very, you know, I go through a, a process with clients, which one, I often have to reteach them about food. Uh, we've become really confused in terms of what's dairy, what's a fat, you know, where does dairy or where, where does cheese fit in? Is that a protein? Are nuts healthy? Are they unhealthy? Uh, there's a lot of confusion out there and there's a lot of confusion around uh, what is a portion. And so we have to start with practical, tactical. Um, that that's great because it gives people something to grab onto and to learn and to sink their teeth in sort of no, no pun intended. <laughs> yeah. and, then, and then, um, then I actually start to do some of the inner work. You know, I think as a certified life coach, I've been doing that for over 12 years now. Um, I do a lot of like, uh, I use the word inner critic and for anybody who doesn't know what that word is, it's like kind of that mean voice inside your head that, uh, either tells you that you're not enough or you can't do this or you're so stupid or why bother or just really kind of tries to sabotage you. Um, I, I really help my clients understand how to work with that negative voice so it's not so loud anymore and to actually start to pay attention to the other things in their life be it in their relationship their career their parenting situation their friendships um, in terms of what's what's creating stress for them what are they unhappy with because a lot of times we don't even know until we're given a space to talk about it and that often can be enough is just to admit what's really going on and and then be able to go through some of the emotional awareness piece. And so, I, yeah, what I do is I teach the difference between eating for physiological reason, reasons and what that feels like and what it, you know, um, what it feels like to eat for true hunger, how you know if you're experiencing true hunger versus when you can tell if it's an emotional eating um, session you're about to engage in. And that starts to give people a bit of a framework, you know, at 10 o'clock or, you know, at eight o'clock, even if you've just finished dinner at seven and you quote unquote feel like something to eat, 
chances are there's not a physiological need for that, right? You've just nourished your body. Right. Um, so what's the real reason? Like, what are you really hungry for? Is it connection? Is it, um, you know, companionship? Is it somebody to laugh with? Is it you're hating that you have work to do still? You know, what's the underneath thing? You know, Jennifer, one thing I found is I often, in that very situation, my, my belly will be full or satisfied or not anywhere close to hunger, whatever whatever level it is, and I'll want something. And it's more of a mouth taste mm. feel thing. I might be, God, I really want something sweet. I really want to eat you know, uh, some chocolate or some ice cream or some, and it's generally a, a sweeter flavor that I that I crave. And then when I really think about it, I'll kind of feel my mouth, taste my mouth. And oftentimes I'll brush my teeth after I eat uh -huh. just, I mean, right away, just to kind of clean my mouth. So I don't have that lingering taste of food. And then what happens after a while is the food starts to go a little bit south and then you want to freshen it up. So you'll eat more for that reason. But I've also found that when I eat strong spices, such as onions and garlic, then I tend to want something sweet later to neutralize it. And so even if I have brushed my teeth, onions and garlic kind of linger, and then I'll want something sweet to sort of squelch that or neutralize that that strong flavor I have in my mouth that's that's remaining. So I I, I love onions and garlic, unfortunately, to eat. So <laughs> I'm not saying you shouldn't eat them because they're bad for you. I'm saying it's best if you don't because it, it'll probably make you crave uh, sugar. And, and even other spices would do the same thing. So a hot you know, hot spicy, hot si you know, hot sauce, or something like that will cause you to crave things to eat later just for mouth sensation and mouthfeel. Well, I think that, I think that's fascinating because, um, and I think that's where bio individuality comes in, right? Like for me, if I've got a sweet craving, actually one of my favorite go-tos is cucumbers with salsa. Um, the spicy of the salsa takes away the craving for sweet. And so maybe because you've had the spicy already, then you, you know, who knows what actually is happening there on the taste buds. Uh, I do know though that, um, like say you were to give in to that desire to have something, mm -hmm. um, and say if you had some emotional stuff going on too, the, the way that sugar acts on the brain in terms of what gets stimulated up there, um, it becomes very hard sometimes to stop eating it because, you know, and especially if you're tired too, which so many of my clients, their, their desire to eat some of the sweet or the salty stuff happens often later at night. Um, a lot of my clients are, are busy, they're working, they're parenting, they're volunteering, they're, they're living big, full lives. And so often they don't get a lot of, you know, downtime or quiet time or, or me time uh, until nine, 10 o'clock at night. And so then they want to claim those two hours to just sort of, uh, you know, relax when often what they really need to do is go to bed. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we burn the candle often just a little bit too often, well, too frequently. And that, um, if, even if we're just a little bit sleep deprived, we, we, we become incapable of making good decisions. And one of the things I hear, and maybe you do too, is why do I know better, but can't do better, right? Like I know I shouldn't do X, Y, or Z, but it's like, I can't stop myself. And uh, well, part of it is, yeah, your, your brain, when you're sleep deprived, it's kind of impaired. You're losing the ability to logically make good decisions for yourself. Oh, I find yeah. That so interesting. It is. It's, you know, we're our worst enemies. We really are. I know. Um, and, and part of what I do and you too is try to show the person what they're doing to sabotage themselves because most of the time they're not, they're not aware of it. Exactly. Um, and we're also talking about, uh, eating when you're, when you really shouldn't be hungry, when your body is not hungry. And I, I have kind of a motto I, I teach my people and food is fuel. And yeah. if we first think of food simply as fuel, it really takes a lot of that other stuff out of there. And I've had plenty of arguments. People say, oh, it's, it's social, it's cultural, it's, you know, whatever, you know, whatever other label you want to put on there. Okay. It can be those other things and it can be enjoyable, but you shouldn't live to eat. That's exactly. eat, to, eat to live, not live to eat. I completely echo that sentiment completely. I think, you know, actually, Glenn, that's making me think. And like often, though, we don't know how else to fill our time. 
And so we know in, in, your, in our 20s, when we had unlimited free time and could go out and be active and didn't have other responsibilities or pressures or financial demands that we had to, to meet, um, what I found sometimes is, is people's worlds start to shrink a little bit. And all of a sudden, what they're doing is they're connecting for appetizers or for drinks or for dinner. And what I sort of share with my clients is think about the real reason you're getting together. Like, is it really for the baked brie or is it for the chance to like see your girlfriends or to see your, like I see family and to talk and to connect. And you know, what's the, what's the real underlying reason you're doing that and focus on that. Let the food be a secondary thing. So yeah, we're very much in alignment around that. Yeah. That's a, that's a great point. A lot of my clients have a hard time losing weight or losing the last the last bit you know five to eight ten pounds yeah. and it's because they drink alcohol mm -hmm. and when i point this out to them they you know and we talk about it they okay i could cut down i could cut down and then once they do they start noticing the pounds start coming off on the scale but one thing they argue is that they want to go out and meet with their friend at a happy hour to have to have drinks that's their only time together and i said well what if you went there and you didn't drink alcohol? And first they give me this horrified look. And then, you know, after with some discussion, they say, okay, I'll give it a shot and see how it is. So they come back the next week and they tell me, you know what? It really wasn't that hard at all. I ordered a, some sort of a bubbly thing with, you know, some sort of drink that they would like that was non-alcoholic and not high in calories. So we're not talking about a soda, but they told me then that they didn't munch on unhealthy food and they mm -hmm. had a, they actually had a better time and they were more present and it wasn't about the food or the drink. It was about their companion. So I, I think that's just, I think that's great. Well, and I mean, alcohol, right? It's, I mean, for me, like I can totally, and this is why I'm so not judgmental around this. Like I've been there and, you know, you have the glass of wine. Uh, I don't know about you all listening, but I certainly wasn't pouring a four ounce um, portion, <laughs> right? And you don't get that when you go to a restaurant. It's typically six ounces or nine ounces. And a nine ounce pour of wine is like eating two, a bit more than two pieces of bread. So have two or three glasses of wine a night mm -hmm. and you've basically eaten half a loaf of bread. And yeah. I know that most people would never sit down with seven pieces of bread and eat it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and yet we'll drink our calories in a heartbeat. Oh, and yeah. when we drink, then you're right. It just decreases our, our inhibitions. And all of a sudden the wings and the pizza and the cheese sticks or whatever the restaurant food is, uh, we, you know, you get hungry when you drink. It's like a weird thing that happens and you just don't make as many good choices. Definitely connected. <laughs> yeah, definitely connected. So one of the things I want to talk to you today about is sugar. I'm in the middle of a sugar series and I'm interviewing people and doing research about really what is the bottom line with sugar? Is it good for you? Is it bad for you? Is it neutral? Why is it, why is it bad if it is? And what can you do about it to still, let's say, enjoy life without feeling like you're in, in jail and without totally totally restricting things that taste good but what's your stance on on sugar is it is it good is it bad is it any somewhere in between well you and i had a chance to talk briefly before we started this and and where i come from is you know i believe that there's a spectrum of health and on one end you have the you know extremists who are going to be kind of every kind of food group um, free, like lactose-free, dairy-free, gluten-free, sugar-free, soy-free, uh, who knows, <laughs> right? And then you're going to have this other side of the spectrum where um, it might be a consistent diet daily of takeout, fast food, high, highly processed foods, and just uh, not a lot of good nutrients in there. Uh, I do not think sugar is good for us. I, In fact, I know that the research has backed that up over and over and over again. What's happened is that our ability to, like, if you think back 100 years ago and the way that people cooked and made food and um, had access to sugar, it was a lot different than now. You know, dessert back then, you would maybe have dessert once a week and it was a treat, right? Um, nowadays, you go to Safeway or to a grocery store and you can come home with cake and a pie and cookies and eat them all in one shot if you want. And so we've gone overboard with our consumption and food companies have been at the heart of driving that. And can I speak a bit more about that? Because I'm oh, super passionate about it. Yes, absolutely. Please do. Okay. 
so, uh, you know, I was sharing, like, uh, when I started to volunteer in my kids' school and at lunchtime and seeing all the stuff that kids are bringing to lunch. And then I, that's what really triggered my fascination with sugar, because you'd see these kids' lunch boxes full of, like, yogurt tubes and yacht drinks and organic fruit gummies and fruit roll-ups and uh, pudding. And some kids would be drinking pop at school, cans of pop. And um, I was in juice boxes, you know, we can probably imagine it. And I was just blown away. And, you know, here's the problem. We're just, we're eating way too much of it. And the food companies back in the fifties and sixties, you know, food companies actually were trying to be our ally. They wanted to try to make food a bit more convenient to give us time with our families. And what they, um, actually started to figure out was convenience sells. If you can make a food convenient and make it taste good, then that is going to drive up their profitability. And the way that you make food taste good is by two things. You add, well, three. You add sugar, you add fat, and you add salt. And so what's happening nowadays is we've got chemists and mathematicians and food scientists creating, quote unquote, food products that are chemically designed to elicit our inability to stop eating them. And what that's called is bliss point. It's an actual term in the food production industry. And what's crazy is children have a bliss point that's twice as sweet as an adult, which is why they can handle that those crazy doses of sugar. And I think what's also happening now for food companies is there's such a drive to be profitable that they are using any kind of marketing claims that they can. And, you know, I grew up in the era, like I was in my teenage years, sort of during the 80s and 90s, when fat-free became the big craze, right? Like licorice, all the candy was marketed as fat-free. And like fat was bad, sugar was okay, right? Sugar didn't make you fat. And now we know the opposite. So we've, we've got to start increasing our awareness about what is in our food. And my belief is that we are eating way too much, but we are still undernourished. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. And I have, uh, well, my head's spinning. I have so many points I wanted to uh, tag on with what you're saying. Um, one is, uh, I'm, I'm glad you brought up salt, sugar, and fat, because I just interviewed Michael Moss, the author of the book, Salt, Sugar, Fat, and he told us about sort of the universal conspiracy amongst the food companies to yeah. to hook us. <laughs> and I don't mean that they've necessarily discussed this and you know, met in dark alleys, but they're out to make a profit. And that is the reason they exist. Craft is a business who wants to continue to be a business and make money for the shareholders and employ people. So they need to make foods that people will buy. And if they have to make something a little bit sweeter to sell their mac and cheese versus the other brand's mac and cheese, then that's what they're going to do. Or a little more salt or a little more fat or that perfect bliss point combination of the three. Yeah. Well, I'm so amazed. He is like a hero of mine. I'm so glad you've interviewed him. And his book was a huge... Um, well, catapult for me, like wanting to spread the word on this. And, you know, as much as you mentioned that there wasn't a dark alley meeting, there kind of was in 1999. Like there was a pivotal point where the food companies had the opportunity to take a stand for good mm -hmm. and they didn't. And instead they said, no, nah, man, it's the consumer's problem. We're going to make our food taste good if they want it. Well, they can go deal with the consequences. And unfortunately, most of us don't have degrees in nutrition and food science. You know, we don't know. We're left as like kind of trusting in a way. And so it's so great that there's so many people like you and like me and all of our colleagues who are, who are really trying to, to, you know, again, not tell people that they have to live in this all or none Puritan health lifestyle. But we do need to start being aware of what we're you know, putting in, like what we're putting into our kitchens and our cabinets and fridges and what we're giving our kids. Because we're set, I was just at the water slide park here in, in you know, where I live, and um, I tell you, Glenn, I just, my heart broke. The number of kids who are clearly at the overweight or obese oh, level yes. was astounding. Uh, yes, astounding. I've, I've seen that myself, and it, it makes me almost cry, and I'm not a crying yeah. man. But uh, it really is horrible, horrible, horrible to see that. Yeah. Um, and, and, and like you said, uh, you, you said it before that you, you think people should eat on a full spectrum and not mm -hmm. do any extremes. And, and, um, I kind of consider myself a nutritional Buddhist in that sense that everything's okay in moderation. I love that. You are listening to the live fit podcast. Please show your support for this show by rating, reviewing, and subscribing. 
You will find more information at livefitpodcast.com. <laughs> yes, you you can eat sugar, but keep it to a minimum. Don't eat it every day. And and we really are kind of the culmination of our habits. Yeah. If uh, you know, if you do something twenty times a day, then guess what? That's that's your habit. And whatever it might be, whether you're drinking water or exercising or or smoking cigarettes, that is your habit, and that's kind of how you are, and that's how you live your life, whether you psychologically identify that way or not. So you really have to look at what you're doing most often. And this really speaks to desserts. Also like you, when I was a kid, we would get dessert. Oh, gee, I, I don't know. I don't think it was even once a week. And it wasn't every time we ate out either. So mm -hmm. it was every great, great once in a while. That's why birthday parties were so coveted because you got to eat cake. Yeah. That just wasn't something that was around. You didn't buy a cake. You didn't just, I mean, every once in a while, I would make a cake, actually, because I really wanted a cake. So I, my mom would tell me, if you want cake, go make one. So I'd go to the store, and I'd get all the ingredients. I'd make a cake, and then I would eat half of it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and now you go to a kid's birthday party, and there's not just cake. There's pop and candy and bowls full of, you know, there's, there's all sorts of stuff. And, you know, like you know, we just had a birthday party last night, and guess what we ate? We ate cake. But the uh -huh. thing is, is that my kids don't spend the day consuming Slurpees and ice cream and, and bags of candy and, um, you know, that sort of stuff. And, like, I've spent a lot of time at the lake this summer and I've watched a lot of sort of lake culture, if you will. Uh -huh. And the sort of degree of permissiveness that we as parents sometimes grant ourselves when it's like a holiday time. And, oh, well, we don't normally do this, but, you know, just this once or just today. And I heard so much justification around, oh, well, we don't normally have juice or we don't normally have pop before noon or we don't normally have these kind of treats, but it's summer, so it's okay. The problem is, is you go back into the school, the fall, the school year, and it's really hard to reel that in. And the other thing is uh, we also sometimes need to have the options of what do we give ourselves or our kids if we're not going to give ourselves sugar, right? Because mm -hmm. the craving does develop, you know, it does become a biochemical hormonal desire to have it. It sets you up on that, like, you know, the high and then the sugar crash and the low. And when you're in the low, you want more sugar. So you feel good again, right? So what do we do to give ourselves, um, well, to give ourselves something to eat instead. And, you know, I think I, I'm going to say here, I can, most, you know, almost all of my clients come to me deficient in the amount of vegetables that they eat and the amount of protein that they consume. We're, and that's so our body stays hungry, right? Because we're not giving our body the basic building blocks that it needs to repair itself and to heal and to be healthy day in, day out. So how do you recommend clients and your client's children stay away from sugar in a real world. Yeah. Yeah. So I do, I, you know, first of all, um, I kind of go for the, the shock approach, right? Like, you know, we start to talk about some basic things that they're, they're consuming. And then I teach them, you know, do you know how much sugar is in that? I teach them how to label read. I teach them how to understand what grams of of sugar are. And what's crazy is right now, North Americans are eating about half a pound of sugar a day. Ah! It's a cup. That's a cup of sugar. So if you go take one cup of sugar and pour it into a glass, like that's what we're doing. And kids, it's even more. Um, and so it's starting to look at the easy wins, right? What can we automatically just cut out or say no to? Like pop really can be an easy thing to just say no to right. or buying bags of candy. I tell people that whatever you put into your cart in the grocery store, you're making a commitment to eat. You might think that you're not going to have it. You might think that you're buying it for your hubby or for your wife or, you know, for a party. But if it's if it comes into your household subconsciously, you're giving yourself permission that it's okay to have it. So we've got to start making really good decisions in a grocery store. And that's where there's so many underlying steps to this because people spend, you know, more time shopping for like a good pair of shoes on eBay than they will thinking about their health and how to organize the week around meals and food prep. Um, I think I read a stat that said we're spending on average of 12 minutes in a kitchen a day. What? Yeah, because it's it, it, shocking, right? Because most of us are grabbing, you know, grab and go food that we get in boxes or jars or packages. We throw into a microwave. We throw the box and the bag out, one dish to clean up. No one's really cooking as much anymore as they used to. So we got to wow. start teaching people how to cook. Yeah, uh, you know, I love that there's an entire network for food, and my kids like watching 
cooking shows and yeah. these cookie challenges and things. I don't let them watch eating contests. I think that is is just completely wrong. Uh, but they do enjoy, you know, like the the cupcake cook off things where you know kids will make cupcakes and then they're they're judged by you know some experts in the field. And so I think that's pretty fun. And and that's rubbed off on my uh, daughter. So she's she's the new cooker coming up. So oh, I, awesome. my wife needs to look out because she's got some, there's a going to be a new sheriff in town pretty soon. Well, you know, and my kids are only seven and nine and here and like, you know, obviously I'm very careful about the way that I talk about my business. You know, we talk about health is a value of ours in our family and we eat to be healthy. And I really teach them about, you know, crazy marketing tactics. Like when they want a toy that's in a cereal box, if we're walking down that aisle for whatever reason, you know, we have the conversation around it. Why do you think they're putting a toy in a cereal box? Doesn't that seem weird? Like if that's <laughs> a toy section, why do you think a company would do that? And they're smart. They're like, well, it's so that we want the cereal, mama, right? And I'm like, yeah. I'm like, it's a you got to teach, right? But you can't, you know, you got to you got to start having these conversations because it's not necessarily about getting thin or losing weight. I don't think families or moms want to paint that picture if they've got daughters or sons at home. But I do think we need to start talking about how do we want to be healthy as a family, and is this a healthy choice right now? Can we make healthier choices? And then what I often hear a lot of pushback on is, oh, my kids won't eat that. And I challenge, oh, yeah. right? I challenge them. I'm like, they, you, I'm like, that's a belief you have until you prove to me that if you do this five or 10 times in a row that they don't eat it, then I'll believe you. And the it is, I say one of the most, like, one of the things I do is when my kids get home from school, a veggie plate with a Greek yogurt dip is always out on the counter. So oh, that's fantastic. I change it every day, but you know, think of the whole spectrum of vegetables, jicama, carrot, celery, grape, tomatoes, cucumber, you know, all of it. And I, and it's always, they get that. And I think we're snack obsessed in North America. Most kids come home from school, they eat another granola bar, another juice box, bag of chips. And then we as parents are, if we hopefully we're cooking dinner and then our kids are too full to eat. So then we complain that they're not eating our dinner. So we just got to back it up a little bit and get our kids, you know, I think if there's one tip I can give to all of you listeners is, you know, do your, Try it, right? Try eating more vegetables and see how you feel. That fiber and that volume and the crunch, it, it's its good. It's good for you. And um, when your body starts to get the micronutrients that it needs, over time, those sugar cravings really do start to go. Have you seen the uh, the movie That Sugar Film? Yes, yes. I, so I watched that with my kids, and it was fantastic. And 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 you were talking about how to, talking to kids, and and I like giving them little examples here and there. Not sit down and have one big lecture on sugar and then be done with it. But we're in the grocery store. Oh, let's let's read a label. Oh, we're at a. Uh, oh, you're going to a party. Well, I, I recommend you don't have cake and soda. And sometimes my kids will go and they'll go against my recommendations. Imagine that, and then they'll <laughs> come home feeling sick. And we yeah. say, well, did. What did you have? And then they start naming naming it and telling me everything they ate. And I said, "Well, that's that's an awful lot of sugar." Um, but you know what's funny is that we we finished watching that sugar film, and I don't I don't think it was even one minute later. My son says, "Oh, Dad, can I have some ice cream?" <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. I know, which is why it's like it's like brushing your teeth, though, right? Like I don't know. I'm sure most parents out here uh, listening. The, think about that basic habit. We do it so that our children have healthy teeth and don't get cavities and so that they can have a full set of teeth by the time they reach adulthood, right? Like that is our end goal with brushing our teeth. Yes, so, yes. Right from when we're, they're little with our finger in their mouth, we'll rub their gums and then we get them into a starter toothpaste and we take them to the dentist. Like we indoctrinate them so that they have a healthy habit. We do not do the same with food. And you know, I think that even just like constantly having vegetables at every meal or having those conversations, because my bet is, Glenn, at one day, you know, that, that that is sinking in, right? Like, it will. It has to. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And repetition. And most of the people that I know now, uh, you know, I, te I teach health and PE and, of course, my personal training, my health coaching, that sort of thing. So I come across a lot of people and we get in this discussion about what their eating habits were like as a child. Yeah. And so many of them, they say, well, I was either on my own or there's a kitchen full of, you know, boxes and they, there wasn't any real foundation for good health. I was pretty fortunate that I, I grew up with a mother who really cared about, 
healthy eating and I was ridiculed a lot. I was in the military and, and in college and people say, oh, you're a health food freak. Why you got to be a health food freak? Just eat whatever, eat whatever you want. And then when you turn 30, then you can start eating healthy. <laughs> so oh, yeah, when I think you're touching on, I, okay, keep going, but I want to come back to this. this. This is such a good point. I, you know, I turned to that guy and I just said, yeah, that that's not very likely to happen. So I'm just going to take care of myself now because I respect my body. I, I definitely I definitely do. And I and I always have. And that's that's what it comes down to. You you get out what you put in. Right. Yeah. Well, and so many of us, I mean, I listen to clients who come to <coughs> complaints about feeling fit, like sick, tired, low energy, irritable, cranky, like, you know, gut issues, uh, digestive issues. And one of the, the thing that I thought was so um, terrific about your point was the fact that if you try to be healthy, there's pure, you, you get ostracized practically. Like if you choose to not drink, if you're the person that brings the veggie tray to the party, if you're the person who chooses to say no to an appy, if you're the person who you get this like, you, it's like you're in a fishbowl. Oh, come on, just have some more. Just have another drink. Why are you worried about that? Like, and what I can't, I find it so crazy that it's that way. It's sort of like, why are we the ones that, you know, when we're trying to make a healthy choice? And so I got really curious about it. And, you know, kind of from the psychology of change research, I, I, I like to, you know, read. It's when um, a lot of people are always looking, well, we're all looking for social approval and validation. So if I'm doing something that I want to do and I get you to do it too, now we're both doing it. So I'm okay because you're doing it too. So it's like acceptance, right? And I think that's a huge thing with drinking. Um, the minute somebody uh, says no to a drink, it creates a bit of tension in a group. It's like, oh, why not? Are you okay? Are you sick? Like, oh, just have a drink. Just enjoy yourself. And the belief is, well, you can't enjoy yourself and you're not, if you're not drinking. I want to enjoy my time with you, so please drink. <laughs> it's right. just crazy. Well, you know, I've had that many times before. I go to a party and I'm bringing a you know, plate of vegetables or something like that. And somebody looks at me and goes, oh, how boring. And yeah. lighten up. I really don't understand that attitude because I don't find a plate of vegetables to be boring. I mean, if you don't like them plain, then dip them in some, you know, convoluted chemical concoction that, that, you know, has some sort of a flavor in it, like ranch dressing. But, um, I love it. I don't know why it has to have a ton of fat and a ton of sugar to be fun. And it's, that brings me to the point of why does food have to be fun anyways? Can't you enjoy food without it being, uh, you know, a roller coaster ride? Yeah. Well, and I, 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 yeah. And I think food can be fun even when it's healthy. You know, like I don't, somebody said to me, do you just crave, like, do you just eat algae and nuts? <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> no. I'm like, I've got two children. Actually, no. I mean, our family is a family of eight. We've got six children spanning from seven to 18. You know, there's a lot of different, uh, there's a lot of tastes and personalities here. We eat good food um, and healthy food can be delicious. So you know, and I guess it goes back to those underlying things, right, which we talked about in the beginning, which is there's a lot of ways we sabotage ourselves. And I think self-neglect is is a huge part of it, being tired, being stressed, not proactively doing something to handle stress. Um, in this day and age, we know that, you know, the toll that stress takes, how we cope with our stress, the desire to soothe stress with things like alcohol and sugar so that we can feel good. Uh, there's sort of this whole kind of complex emotional biochemical habitual ecosystem at play, if you will. And just simply addressing the one part of it, oh, don't eat sugar and maybe exercise, it does not move people along a spectrum very well or very quickly. No, and I, I'm glad you brought up stress because that really is the underlier with a lot of this, uh, especially sugar eating. I, I teach a, a stress management class, and that's something that comes up a lot is mm -hmm. these things that people intake to try to de-stress. And it might work temporarily. You know, having that having a drink might work, but I uh, equate it to a bulldozer scraping dirt and pushing it in front of it. It might clear the spot immediately behind it, but the further, it, the more it pushes, the longer it's pushing it, the more dirt that piles up in front of it, which you're eventually going to have to deal with. Exactly. Yeah. And, and then just even, um, I think that's so cool. You teach that because, uh, you know, we start to talk about how stress affects some of the hormones involved with satiety and hunger. Um, they get affected too. And so I say to my clients, if you're not doing something to proactively handle your stress, then you're in the process of engaging in self-sabotage. 
as simple as that. And I don't mean you have to go and sit and say om for an hour a day or light a candle or, Mm -hmm. you know, run on the trails and pound it out. But I'm talking like taking five minutes for yourself or even a minute, just a couple of times throughout the day to breathe, you know, to check in on your thoughts. I call it, you know, I kind of teach my clients about metacognition, how to think about their thinking. Is their thinking taking them in a good direction or a bad direction? Oh, perfect. And yeah. And, and coming back down to what's true right now in this moment. Are you okay? If you're like, truly just see, see an assessment. Am I okay? Yes, I'm okay. You know, am I worrying about something that might be happening tomorrow or next week or next year? Do I really need to worry about that right now? Probably not, right? Because your body does not know the difference between real stress that you're experiencing in the moment and imaginary, like the things that you're imagining happening, the physiological response is the same. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, real or imagined stress is, it's all the same. It really doesn't matter. It's its still stress and your body responds to it the same way. And, you know, some stress is, is good because it will help you work at your at your best and be sharper and maybe a little bit quicker and it gets you out of bed and it, <laughs> in the morning gets you off the couch. But yeah. you know, as with uh, Goldilocks, we need just the right amount. Yeah, absolutely. And um, one of the things I touch on too is, you know, for anybody out there who feels like they're just constantly tired and just can't, you know, quite get their, you know, get up and go, um, you know, give yourself a challenge. Like try to get yourself into bed even 30 minutes earlier and ask yourself if that Netflix binge or whatever it might be, the the game, my kids taught me about Slither.io or something the other week. And I was like, Ooh, this is a fun game. (laughs) Um, You know, do you really need that? Could going to bed be better? And then that brings into, you know, could you be hanging out with your partner? You know, as opposed to just sort of pretending to connect and you're watching TV on the couch together, could you actually like turn the TV off and sit and hold hands and talk to each other about, hey, you know, how's your day? How's life going these days? And um, I think there's so much more value in some of that. But we just, again, that takes energy, right? So if you don't have energy, you don't feel like you have, you know, even have the wherewithal to even start doing that. And that's where physical activity comes in. That's the best yeah. way to give you energy, especially if you've been sitting all day, cooping that energy up, locking it down. So get up and go for a walk every chance you get. Yeah. And I think you and I sound the same. Like, you know, I teach my clients, you cannot train your nutrition, right? So if you think exercise is the mecca for weight loss, it's not. Is it the, one of the best things you can do for your body? A hundred percent. Yes. And I love that you said get up and go for a walk because so often there's this belief out there that it has to be this hard, intense, horrible exercise in spandex. And uh, <laughs> no, it doesn't, right? Like we know from the health research, and I mean, everything I teach is best practices is, you know, bouts of 10 minutes, 10 minute activity bouts can change your health profile. I think that's amazing. Yeah, it is. Well, Jennifer, it was really wonderful talking to you. I think we could probably continue talking for a couple more hours, um, you know, just spitballing ideas on how to help people become as healthy and fit and stable and balanced and happy as they possibly can in their lives. Um, But they can follow me. They can follow you listen to more of our podcasts. And you have a podcast coming out, right? I do. Yeah, I'm super excited. Uh, It's called Energy to Thrive. My belief after working with so many women and hearing, oh, I'm just surviving, was that that that's no way to live life. And uh, yeah, that's coming out right away. Wow, that's exciting. So I will put uh, a link to your podcast, your website on my show notes page. Is there anything you'd like to say? Yeah, you know, I just want to invite anybody, if you are serious about trying to learn some simple steps to cut back on your sugar cravings, um, you know, what I did create something. It's a it's a free document and you can get it at jenniferpowder.com forward slash sugar dash detox. And it takes you through sort of 10 simple steps that you can implement over the course of a day to experiment and to play with it. And it's just, it's simple little things. And you can even start with trying one step a day and then adding in another step and then adding in another step. But it has a couple of good recipes in it and some tips for some ways to get yourself to bed earlier and to sleep better and how to feel better when you wake up in the morning. And, um, you know, sometimes we just need a place to start, a guide. And uh, I had fun creating that. So so please feel free to grab that. Well, good. Wonderful. Yeah, I have a few guides like that as well. So I will be sure to put the link to that one on your show notes page. And uh, once again, it's been a pleasure and we'll keep in touch. 
Yeah. Thank you so much, Glenn, for all that you do. It's amazing to have met you. Yeah, you too. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Live Fit Podcast. Please subscribe and share with someone you care about. Read show notes, articles, resources, and learn more about our weight management programs at livefitpodcast.com. Once again, thanks for listening and always remember to live fit.